Hello, I'm Colin McCage, and on this episode of the Green Street Beat, we are talking about the upcoming April 4th municipal general election, where we'll take a deep dive into each of the bond questions presented and what impact it could have on the city. Let's do this. On April 4th, Lee Summit voters will have an opportunity to consider three separate general obligation bond questions for the purposes of one, public safety, two, transportation, and three, city facilities reinvestment. The approximate total cost of the projects is $186 million. Of that $186 million, $74 million is for public safety and emergency preparedness with eight projects, $98 million for 10 transportation projects, and $14 million for five city facilities reinvestment projects. To help us best understand the no-tax increase bond and how it will affect Lee Summit, I'm speaking to City Manager Mark Dunning, Chief of Police Travis Forbes, Fire Chief Michael Snyder, and Director of Public Works Michael Park. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So let's talk about the questions presented and some of the projects involved, beginning with question one, public safety and emergency preparedness. Of the $74 million approximate cost of question one, $35.7 million of it is going to the Joint Operations Facility a standalone facility just west of police headquarters. What specifically is it, and why does Lee Summit need it? Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, this is probably one of our most exciting projects on it. And and when you look at it, we were challenged to bring all of the plans, all of the audits, all the strategic uh, initiatives together from the community and from the council, and and this project does just that. I think it's probably the first project that – that goes beyond the capabilities of what City Hall does on a daily basis. And when I say that, it's bringing multiple departments together to perform one function. Uh, So we're very excited about that, bringing all those resources into one location uh, to ensure that we can provide uh, not not just a a reactive response to our community in a time of need, but also a proactive response uh, uh, during daily operations. The Joint Operations Center uh, itself is is really uh, two different components. The first component is the lower part of the facility, which is going to be hardened to uh, ensure that we are able to withstand any weather events, et cetera. And of that facility, we're going to have four different components bringing four departments together. Uh, The first one is going to be a co-location of our communication center. Uh, For those that aren't aware, our police department and fire department currently have our own communication centers operating out of separate locations. As part of our 2019 audit, when it was conducted, it advised that we should do uh, the first phase of consolidation of technology, which we are nearing completion of that. Uh, This proposal is going to allow us to move into the next phase of that audit recommendation, which is the co-location of those two facilities or two uh, communication centers into one facility. The three remaining components that will be going down into that is uh, our IT infrastructure for the city. Uh, Today we've recognized that we need to ensure that uh, it's in a safe and secure environment as well to uh, provide during a time of emergency uh, to ensure that those stay up and running. Uh, A third component is going to be our emergency operations center. Uh, I'll be very honest, we do very, we do okay with what we have today, uh, but it does not allow us to be proactive. We use a multi-use space that we have to uh, tear down and set up uh, in the event of emergency, and this will allow that facility to stay up and running each and every day. And when I was speaking earlier, I said it it allows us to move from more of a reactive stage to a proactive stage. Mm -hmm. We have many events that occur throughout the city that are not emergencies that we have to work with other departments to ensure that we have a joint plan uh, to ensure the safety of our community. This will allow us to do that, ultimately providing for the needs today well into the future for for the community in regards to those daily operations and emergency response. Uh, The fourth component is a public works component, uh, which is traffic operations center. Uh, It's something that's been a focus of the public works department for a long time, and uh, and it ensures on the same theme, it allows us to move from a reactive approach to a proactive approach to the daily needs of our citizens when it comes to traffic and it also allows us to operate during an emergency operations event. Uh, The last component would be a relocation of the fire administration out of the current location at station number one off of Douglas uh, to the upper floor of that facility. Uh, It'll allow us to have uh, the ability to meet the needs today as well as grow into the future for those needs of of the fire department. And uh, one final uh, item that will be included in there is is a media relations room that we can work uh, throughout the city in, in the time that we need to communicate to the to the citizens well that's awesome it really is a capture of a lot of different parts of the city a lot of departments um does anyone else have anything to say about the joint operations facility yeah i'll just say that you you just never know what we're going to experience uh and this allows us to be able to be reactive to 
whether it be a large scale violence that occurs or a weather related event or uh, like uh, Chief Snyder referred to downtown days or Oktoberfest, these festivals that we have from time to time where the public wants to feel very safe and enjoy themselves. Uh, these types of operation centers allow us to combine all city resources and all city technology to monitor these events and make sure that we're handling them to the best of our ability. So that proactive ability is uh, taking it to the next level as far as public safety goes in Lee Summit. And Colin, I'd just add that the proposed location for this facility would be immediately west of the police, the current police and court facility. So it's on property that the city already owns. And so uh, kind of creating a public safety campus in that area. One thing I would like to mention, and Chief Snyder touched on this, is the, the traffic element to the Joint Operations Center. A community of our size, I think, is in dire need to do more active traffic management. Uh, we, at this point in time, we have no ability to monitor our traffic signals and make changes. And so while there is certainly an improvement for our emergency response and reacting to certain situations within the community, I think there's also a lot of efficiencies gained through uh, the shared communications with the police department, the fire department, and with then traffic operations uh, so that we can have day-to-day -day impact throughout the community of creating safer, more efficient, better operating uh, conditions within our roadways uh, with less delay. All amazing answers. We'd like to see that it's a proactive response in the city and making sure that people are safe, especially in a large scale, things like downtown days. It's amazing to hear. Um, let's go to the next question. Police headquarters was partially renovated in 2021 as part of the 2019 no tax general obligation bond. All updates were not completed due to budget. What new renovations are needed? The uh, primary things that we did with the police building with the first bond issue were internal. We did a lot of changes to the uh, security and to the just the, the flow of work inside the police and courts building. We didn't really do a whole lot externally. And so uh, with the potential for a joint operations center, it makes sense to uh, look at making some changes to the outside of the police building to include things like another access point from Sloan Road, uh, just west of the police building. This would serve both that joint operations center and the police department. In uh, improving the parking facility for employee parking, we've kind of reached our limit uh, as far as secure employee parking goes, which is good. It shows the growth of the department and public safety in Lee Summit, but people have to have a place to park. Uh, we're looking at things uh, like covered parking for our emergency vehicles. I tell people the internals of the police cars anymore are more expensive than the police car itself with all the technology that's inside of these vehicles. So it's uh, come to a point where we need to do a really good job of protecting those cars and protecting the investment we have in those vehicles uh, and also uh, making them available to respond quickly. So as of now, they're not covered. They're kind of exposed to the elements. So we would like to uh, provide some covered parking for those vehicles. Then there's things um, just maintenance wise, like the roof of the police building is original to the building itself, which was uh, built in the mid nineties. So it, uh, it needs some attention. Uh, really internally, the only thing we're looking at doing is if we shift our dispatch resources to the Joint Operations Center, uh, it would allow us some space to build out a real-time crime center, which would focus all of the police technology that we have in one location and allow our analysts to uh, real-time monitor the city for public safety issues that could arise, uh, let the officers out in the field know about that information that they received, and again, better protect the city with that uh, additional space we would have from the shift of our dispatch to the Joint Operations Center. So once again, a great proactive response instead of just being reactive, that space would be able to be uh, ensure that people's safety comes to mind, once again, for question one. Correct, yes. And I, I just kind of equate it to, I think we do a very good job in Lee Summit public safety-wise, but we're always asking how can we be even better? And uh, by being more proactive in both the Joint Operations Center and some of these improvements in phase two of the police uh, courts building renovation, I think we're moving in that direction. That's awesome to hear. Um, for our next question, due to the northern growth of Lee Summit, a fire station is proposed near land next to the airport. How would this serve the community? 
Right, very much so. And and this really is going to be a phased in approach with the purchase of this property and design of this building. We have two demands that are placed on us uh, with that within that area. A, the number one, the first demand uh, or consideration is the airport and what is our capability to respond to aircraft rescue firefighter needs within that facility. And then second, the Ford public facing fire station. Uh, I don't have an exact timeline on which will occur first at this point uh, as we monitor growth to the north. Um, but knowing that the airport's where it's at and it's not relocating, uh, we know that this is going to be a prime area for us to, uh, for, to consider the placement of additional station. You'll notice that uh, the design is considered as part of this question as well. Uh, within the next couple years, we would begin that process, and we would probably anticipate doing a phased uh, build of that, uh, not knowing which one would come first or second. It will be based on the public uh, forward-facing demand or the uh, request of the airport to meet their needs. Colin, one of the things we're <clears throat> strategically thinking about with this this future station is the needs as 1,100 acres of undeveloped property on the east side of I-470 incrementally comes online for development. And we think the positioning of this station uh, to serve the airport, but also future uh, properties that would develop uh, would serve us very well into the future. All great answers to this question. Uh, next question, we've seen a lot of growth in South Lee Summit as well, both retail and residential. And to protect the south side of the city, a proposed police substation will be part of question one. Chief Forbes, could you tell us why it was chosen and the benefits of the substation? Yeah, a substation in this part of the city has actually been part of the conversation here uh, since before I was here. Uh, around 2010 with Lee Summit 360, this was brought up as the strategic planning process back then. Uh, if you look at our city, I think most people who've been here quite some time know north to south, it's a very long city. It takes quite some time to get from 40 Highway to uh, uh, 150 Highway down south. And uh, our police headquarters, which is a, a very good building, we've obviously invested in it with a prior bond issue and potentially with this one too. It's more skewed a little bit to the north, although it's uh, somewhat center in the city as well. But getting to, to the south part of the city takes some time. Uh, we have heard from residents down there a request to have a uh, greater police presence either through a facility or, or just more police presence uh, with their vehicles and such. And this provides us an opportunity to take advantage of the old Fire Station 5, which they are currently uh, getting ready to vacate with the uh, construction of the new Fire Station down there, and repurpose that into a South Substation. This is a very economical way to do that. I think we can uh, get quite a bit out of that building and, and repurposing it. It has good bones, so to speak, that we can work with. And it would provide services like uh, people could file police reports uh, or they could obtain copies of police reports instead of coming all the way to 10 Northeast Tudor. Uh, we could also use it as an evidence drop off for uh, police officers who are working districts in that part of the city instead of having to come all the way to police headquarters to drop off evidence from a case they could uh, use it in that facility and keep them in their districts longer. So people like to see their, their officers in their neighborhoods and things of that nature, and that's what we're trying to do. So this gives us a great opportunity to repurpose an existing uh, city facility and uh, save some money, but provide uh, what has been long called for in that part of the city. That's great to see. So on to the next question, facilities in the city are aging. Animal Controls Building is 15 years old. Fire Station 6 and 7 are 27 and 16 years. The Police Department is 24. And the Fire Headquarters is 48 years old. What is the city doing to reinvest in these structures? So I'll go ahead and take that question. Fire Station number 1 uh, obviously is, is the oldest building that you just mentioned at 48 years. Um, for some in the public, they may see that uh, it has been updated as it was had the exterior redone in uh, the early 2000s. Unfortunately, it's one of the facilities that we have not paid too close of attention to on the interior. Uh, so it's at a point to where we do need to consider, you know, what is our best uh, avenue to proceed down uh, in rectifying that issue. We know that uh, internally it has a lot of major components that it needs to be uh, corrected from the sewer to the plumbing, electrical, et cetera. Um, so, so we're going to work with professionals if this is approved to identify what is that be best path moving forward. We also know that we have needs of our personnel that need to be met. Um, times have changed in the last 48 years. 
and uh, addressing those needs through this remodel will be a, a huge advantage to our personnel today and moving into the future. I mentioned earlier, fire administration would be moving out of that facility. Um, that's going to free up space so that we can not only meet the needs today, but as we've been discussing, be proactive for the future, allowing it for it to be built to allow additional resources to be housed there uh, as demands increase. Obviously, it's great to build brand new buildings and uh, uh, things of that nature, but it's also uh, very important, and I think, uh, uh, for a city to look at reinvesting in the facilities that it already has. So if you look at uh, Fire Station 5, repurposing it into a substation, uh, taking a look at Fire Station 1 and trying to determine what is the best route to go with that, uh, looking at City Hall, which is uh, older than people think when you look at the age of these things, if you look at your own home, you get about 10, 15, 20 years into your own home, and you start to look around and say, man, I think we kind of need to refresh some things, and we need to maintain some things in order to stay here longer and reinvest in it. That's kind of the same thing with these city facilities. We need to take a look at uh, all of the facilities we have and be good caretakers of those facilities and good stewards of these prior investments the city has had in these facilities and make sure that we maintain them for well into the future uh, to stretch the public dollar even further. Completely agree. It is important to take care of what we already have and reinvest in our city. On to question two, transportation. We see that 83.25 million of the 98 million are road projects. What projects will we see in Lee Summit from this proposed ballot and why are we pursuing these improvements? Well, there's a list of road projects that uh, had been reviewed with our city council and mayor identified from master plans, such as our thoroughfare master plan that contribute to the city's Ignite strategic plan and comprehensive plan for community growth. Uh, you'll note those projects like Shear Road and Longview or Todd George Parkway are all major arterials impacting the entire community. Uh, they're projects that impact safety, such as Shear. Uh, we have very much know that Shear Road is, is a narrow roadway, kind of has that rural context, within our community, but carries a fair amount of traffic, uh, used heavily by students, and actually a fire station seven located right along the corridor. Um, another project like Todd George Parkway, it isn't so narrow, but yet it is still two lanes and uh, surrounded by property that is really ripe for development. Uh, it's also got current volumes today that create a sense of congestion. Uh, Todd George Parkway from Colburn Road North to Woods Chapel, really is that major arterial that serves as a reliever to I-470. And without any plans by the state at this point in time to improve I-470, uh, every passing day, more traffic seems to gravitate towards Todd George Parkway. So we want to proactively get ahead of that, not just for development, but for the users of today. Uh, then there's Longview Boulevard. That is really a companion project to Shear Parkway, one that is less than a half mile, um, a future roadway, if you will, future major arterial, to provide that north-south connectivity throughout our community. Um, some other more localized projects that made the list had been uh, demands of our constituents, uh, projects brought forward by our elected officials, not just projects within our thoroughfare plan, but projects like Douglas, south of 4th Street to Blue Parkway, south side of downtown one of the remaining unfunded gateways to the downtown location. Uh, then there's also other safety improvements like turn lanes at key intersections along Langsford Road, east of Todd George, and finishing out that corridor to our eastern city limits east of Blackwell. Uh, another project that has been highlighted multiple times over the last few years is Lakewood Way, north of Woods Chapel to our north city limits. Uh, this project would provide additional safety enhancements, turn lanes at key intersections, multimodal facilities like sidewalks or paved shoulders, and, and lighting. So those are kind of the general scope of these major roadway projects. Uh, and outside of roadway, we have other transportation elements of this bond question, and that's to build more sidewalks. Uh, sidewalks are very popular throughout the city of Lee Summit. Uh, we have tens of millions of dollars of sidewalk gaps every reach of the City of Lee Summit, and this is just an incremental way of trying to address some of those sidewalk gaps following the prioritization that our elected officials have sent to the city staff on where those sidewalk gaps would be uh, closed. Thank you. That, that gave me a great general idea of what's going on for our transportation side. Mark? Yeah, Colin, I, <clears throat> I just add that uh, some of these major uh, road improvement projects would also enhance 
connectivity from other modes of transportation, uh, pedestrians, bicycling, things of that nature. That is a high priority for this community. So those aspects would be integrated into these, these major projects. And so I like to think of this is a strategic approach uh, to target safety concerns, capacity concerns, and an, an approach to strategic economic development within these, within these specific areas of our community. I, I just mentioned these projects touch on a number of our strategic critical success factors. Uh, they do provide that multimodal element, that livability for a community, enhance safety and operations. They support economic growth and opportunity for uh, the continued development and growth of this city. Uh, but they're not all proactive projects. While they support the proactive growth of our community, they are also addressing current needs of our citizens, whether they be safety issues or capacity issues. Uh, I think every one of these transportation projects highlight more than one uh, critical success factor for the City of Lee Summit. We, we have identified these projects as those that support our master plans and our strategic plans. I believe that two of the projects on this list involve the airport, and that is also following the airport master plan, the airport business plan, one to acquire property, property that has been identified in those master plans to support a future air traffic control tower. Uh, it isn't to provide an air traffic control tower right now, but it's best if we identify the location and secure the property for that in the future. And the other is for Hangar 2. And Hangar 2 is a, a project where we know existing demand for hangar space is available. Um, it is one where we have a collaborative partnership in the process with the R7 school district to expand their aviation programs at the airport. It is one that also supports our business plan to generate the revenue so the airport is more sustainable. That's awesome to hear, especially the aviation programs for students. So you mentioned Southwest Shear Parkway or Shear Road from Samson to Samson Road to 291. Why did we choose this project and what is specifically going into it? Well, Shear Parkway is one that is so expensive, we're not likely to find funds outside of a major bond issue such as question two. Um, it is one project, a major arterial east-west throughout our community that connects 291 Highway, really beyond our, our city limits, all the way to I-49. Uh, it is a completely different roadway once you leave Lee Summit to the west. You notice it is a wide, four-lane, median-divided parkway, and it really takes that characteristic all the way west of Lee Summit through Kansas City, beyond Kansas City, into Grandview and, and to I-49. Um, as I mentioned, it, it is very narrow. It's quite hilly. Uh, the project will reconstruct it entirely, and it will extend that four-lane divided cross-section with trail, lighting, sidewalks, all those elements that you would see in a ward road south of Shear. That, that's kind of a good example of the type of project we're looking to build. One that is built for the future, not another interim step, not just widening for two lanes and adding shoulders like we did on Hook Road west of 291, but uh, something that we don't have to revisit for, for decades. And I think with that, you will see that the alignments, the vertical alignment will smooth out. Um, obviously the road will be widened and we'll address those safety needs and it will be a project that eliminates the barriers that currently exist for development of those 3,000 plus acres surrounding Shear. Well, that's exciting, especially hearing about trails for health and lighting to ensure safety. On, on to the next question, how about Todd George Parkway? You mentioned that a lot in the first question, on uh, question two. From Colburn to Woods Chapel, what is the cost and time frame that will be going into this project? So Todd George Parkway is a, a large job. We estimate right now about $24 million. Uh, the characteristics of Todd George would also be multimodal uh, with lighting, trails, and sidewalks. Uh, the cross section of Todd George will be very similar to that of Todd George South of Colburn Road, you know, the median, the four lanes. And so if you're trying to envision what it might look like between Colburn and Woods Chapel, uh, you don't have to drive very far. Uh, it's, it's a roadway that we're extending. Uh, it is a project also to address capacity. Uh, today, we experience anywhere from 10,000 to 15,000 cars a day. Not so bad, but it does have peak volumes that do feel quite congested, and that congestion contributes to safety and, and crashes in the area. Um, and as 470 becomes more and more overloaded without any plans to improve I-470, it is the reliever uh, for I-470 in a north-south pattern of travel. 
Uh, so we anticipate trying to get ahead of that, not just for expected development surrounding that corridor, but uh, to address the current day needs. Um, I would just say Todd George Parkway is also one of those projects, like all the projects on question two, that may take years to develop. You know, a project the size of Todd George Parkway or Shear Parkway, uh, they take years to move from design, relocate utilities, acquire the property and right of way through construction. Some of these may take upwards of five years from start to completion. And none of the projects at this point in time have been sequenced, so I can't give you a start date. Um, the start date of each of the projects on question two will heavily rely on when is the best time to sell bonds. Um, it will rely on what is the need for each of these projects and what available resources do we have to carry out the work. And so we will go through a process for all of the projects on question two, and, and really question one and three, through our capital improvement planning process. Uh, I expect if this issue passes on April 4th, that we will begin that work with the mayor and city council this fall to start planning the sequence of all of these projects and the prioritization of these projects through the capital improvement planning process, which is a public process that we engage in every year to update that plan. Uh, currently going through that process right now and usually concludes sometime around June. That's great to hear, especially the future parts is to ensure that we see in the next, hopefully next five years, some of these projects come to fruition. Um, let's go talk about the airport. The airport, like you said, could potentially receive a 40,000 square foot hangar in question two if it passes. Why do we need it and what opportunities will be presented with this new hangar? The airport relies on land leases and hangar rentals and currently we have a hangar one fully occupied. We know there's a waiting list for additional hangar space. Uh, really the next step in our airport master plan and airport business plan is growth on the east side of the airport. Uh, hangar two is proposed on that east side of the airport. We're, we're following through later this year with infrastructure to support that east side development. Uh, what's next in those dominoes of activity is hangar two. We, we know we start to build activity. It creates that synergy. You get more private investment. And Hangar 2 rentals also drive fuel sales. Uh, fuel sales at the airport are a critical component to the success of our airport and its sustainable revenue source. That's great to hear. You mentioned um, something of the effect of students potentially using the space as well. So we are working with the Lee Summit School District on opportunities, whether it be Hangar 2, um, repurposing space within Hangar 1 as we're able to move our terminal operation out of Hangar 1 into Hangar 2, or a more larger long-term terminal space on the east side of the airport or another location within the airport's ground so they can be in an immersive environment. Uh, we just see this as an opportunity that Hangar 2 may provide and are currently collaborating with them on that possibility. So what if question two is not approved by voters? What will happen to Lee Summit Roads and other transportation projects? Well, the projects on this question, uh, whether it be Shear Parkway, Todd George Parkway, Lakewood Way, are of such size and scope and cost that they would just be deferred for our next no tax increase bond question. Um, I don't foresee us having within the small margin of uh, sales tax. We have a capital improvement sales tax and we have a list of committed projects associated with that 2017 ballot measure to complete. And, and we're just now five years into that 15 year sales tax. It may be at the end of that, we have met all of our commitments and there's a balance to try to tackle one of these projects, uh, but I can't say that at this time. We also have a transportation sales tax, a permanent sales tax that was created many decades ago. Uh, that project and those sales taxes would not marry together. There, there just isn't the funding opportunity in that revenue stream to carry out any of these improvements. And so we would look towards a future no tax increase question uh, to put before the, the voters if this particular question failed to uh, advance these priorities that our city council has chosen uh, to fund. Chief Forbes, do you have anything to say about the safety improvements for question number two? Yeah, I'll just uh, say that obviously from a public safety perspective, our great interest is in making sure the roadways are very safe. When you have challenging engineering issues with roadway design, it makes our job a little more difficult. So when we hear about a project like Shear Parkway, it's kind of music to our ears because we look at that road and we think people are using it anyway to get east and west in the southern part of our city. And if it's improved where the, the hills are, are reduced, 
where sight lines are improved, where capacity uh, is uh, more available, is going to make our job much easier to keep that roadway safe because we know people are going to use it anyway as the city grows. And uh, to hear about these projects makes us know that uh, it's going to be a lot easier for us to keep our roadway safe in Lee Summit. That's exciting. Uh, now on to question three. Of the total $186 million requested, only $14 million is for question three, city facilities reinvestment. What are some highlighted projects that we can expect? Thanks for the question, Colin. Although it is $14 million, I would, I would uh, offer this, that the, the city has done a, what we call a facility condition assessment on our municipal buildings. That's something we haven't had uh, done for our, our city facilities. And we're taking guidance from that facility con- condition assessment And that 14 million represents, I'll I'll call them the major systems uh, reinvestments that we need to be mindful of for these facilities. So it is, it incorporates things like a city hall roof replacement, uh, other facilities uh, replacements of their roofs, uh, pavement uh, replacement, as well as mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems that need some uh, renovation as well. So these are major systems improvements for these facilities that we take uh, from our facility condition assessment. What that facility condition assessment does for us is is look at these systems, if you will, and helps us understand what is the lifespan of these systems and be ahead of that. Again, we've we've used the term proactive. I think the last thing we want to do is have roof uh, leaks and and that leads to additional damage. So we need to be ahead of that. And that's what, uh, in many ways, this facility condition assessment does for us. The 14 million is not all of our uh, facility needs. We do have a, a, a program in place that uh, we reinvest in these facilities, but it does not cover these major expenses, and that's something we learned through this facility condition assessment. This would inject some revenue, some op- some resources into getting ahead of those reinvestments in these facilities that we need to be mindful of. I think you asked about some of the major uh, projects. So <clears throat> I mentioned City Hall. We also have a public works maintenance maintenance facility out on Hamblin Road that I believe was constructed in the late 90s that has some major systems uh, opportunities out there. Uh, The city still owns, I still call it the WPA post office, used to be the old city hall. The city still, and now it's the Historical Society uh, Museum. The city still owns that facility. There's some exterior uh, investment that needs to be done in that facility. We have our old water operations facility up at Douglas and Chipman Road. That's a major gateway to our downtown that we would like to uh, continue to hold on to as we move through some of these projects that we've talked about uh, and make a reinvestment in in that facility as well. That's uh, front and center uh, and right on our gateway uh, to the downtown. Uh, So some of those are some of the other facilities would would, uh, benefit from uh, this 14 million that we're talking about. So other than the facilities, um, I have a good question about the enterprise resource planning software that was mentioned. How will this help citizens? So we call it an ERP system, enterprise resource planning system. And the best way I can explain that uh, for folks to understand would be think of that that software, that, that connectivity between all of these organizations within the city. All departments use the ERP system. That is the spine or the backbone for our financial systems, financial management, as well as our personnel and and HR functions. So it's a major component that that touches every one of our departments, so it comes at an extreme cost. We know that in, I'll say, 2025, that the system that we're currently uh, being supported by, that support will go away. Uh, as you can imagine, technology, as it ages and new technology comes out, then they, the, the, those companies discontinue their support to try to move uh, onto new platforms. That's what we're faced with. It comes to, the, uh, to a cost of estimated six and a half million. Uh, we can split that cost between, and we have in these questions, between our emergency preparedness and public safety question, because about half of that ERP system supports public safety. And then the other half is in the city, city facility reinvestment uh, question, uh, supporting other things like public works and our codes, uh, development services and law and those other uh, general departments. So it's a major system that the, heavily, that the city heavily relies upon to manage fiscal uh, management and, and our personnel. For all departments, correct? For all departments. So what, you said that it was split between two questions. What if one question passes and one does not? 
It's a great question. Uh, if one passes and the other does not, we would work with the mayor and the council to find the resources necessary through other sources uh, to replace this system. It's that important uh, to make sure that we move on to this new platform so that we can continue to, to be uh, fiscally responsible and managing all of our resources wisely throughout the community. Um, you mentioned some of the facilities that are going to be hopefully get some reinvestment from the question three. Uh, specifically City Hall, which was built in 2006, and since then it has not been modernized to today's standards. Workforce needs has changed in the last 17 years as well. Why is this important to our voters that City Hall be renovated? So if we talk about how we as, as, as an organization utilize City Hall, that was, as you mentioned, con completed in 2006. The iPhone didn't exist in 2006, so technology has come a long way. And we know we have opportunities within this facility uh, to enhance our te technology. In my mind, investment in technology should result in efficiency and effectiveness of, of municipal services. So that's, that's a big component of looking at City Hall and asking ourselves, how can we utilize, better utilize this space so that service enhancements uh, can, be, can be realized by this community? In addition, organizationally, when you think about our departments and how we go about providing these services, those have changed over time since 2006. So space needs comes into play. The third component to this is looking at this facility from a safety perspective. And we know that we have uh, some challenges within certain areas where exits uh, for certain uh, personnel are, are, are top of mind. Uh, the, the environment in which uh, we work has changed dramatically since 2006. Uh, that was part of that phase one renovation for our police department. If you think about that facility prior to the renovation, you could walk into the police department and you were in, in some wide open spaces, and we have some of those challenges here with our city hall as well. Uh, and so given today's environment, there's some safety enhancements that we uh, should be mindful of as well. You mentioned a part of question three is the reuse of the former water operations building on Chipman and Douglas for 350000 What are the potential uses for that building? Uh, Long-term uses, we are uncertain, but if we think about some of these other projects that we've referenced, uh, especially in the public safety and emergency preparedness categories, uh, I'll take us back to when we renovated the first phase of renovation of police, police building. Uh, we moved some of our police operations into that building while the building was renovated. That created opportunities to save uh, some time and money in that renovation project. That opportunity still exists when we think about if Station 1 were to be uh, re remodeled or, or replaced in, to some extent, that we would still need to uh, hold operations in a centrally located downtown uh, space for our fire operations. And so that space uh, could provide that opportunity while uh, some of those projects were underway. So thinking strategically, we're intentionally uh, looking at that space until we get through some, some of these, uh, well, let's get through the April 4th vote and see what direction we get there. Um, now, eventually, the question will come, at what point in time is that, is that property no longer needed for the long-term use uh, by, by the city? And that's something that we would discuss with the mayor and the council. The mayor and the council are the ones that uh, make the decision whether that be declared surplus property or not. But uh, we're not ready to, uh, to look to uh, uh, have other uses occupy that space just yet. I would say, additionally, so um, we have what we call high service pump station, uh, a, a structure on that property that we know we'll need to continue to, to operate and to maintain. So it's not like the whole property eventually could become available for other uses. Uh, we'll, no, we'll still need to have a presence on that property. But uh, for the time being, we think a reinvestment in that property would serve the city well for the next few years. Uh, into the future until that determination is made on long-term needs uh, from a new municipal perspective. Thank you, Mark. Do any of you have more information or like to say anything else about questions one, two, and three? Colin, I'd just like to share, maybe it's important for uh, our citizens to understand, how did we come up with these, with these uh, projects or initiatives? And uh, let, the, let the citizens know, too, that this is a different approach to a no-tax increase bond issue. And the reason I say it's a different approach, if, I, if we look at the city's history on going to the citizens on no-tax increase bond issues, it would tell us that perhaps every three to five years, we're going out and asking the voters, we've, we've retired debt, and are you willing to maintain the same debt service uh, levy? And, and fund new capital projects. Um, those every three to five years, I'll say those amounts range between 15 to 30 million uh, in the past. This approach is a longer term strategic approach. You mentioned at the beginning, 186 million between three questions. 
So this is more of a strategic approach, and, 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 and folks should know that. The city does not anticipate that we would issue $186 million in debt all at once. This would be methodically worked through in a strategic way in tranches, and, and that affords us as, as a city and working with the mayor and the council to manage this debt. Uh, through that time period. So think 10 plus years uh, that this 186 million would be implemented over time. The other thing that I'd like to share is where did staff and mayor and the council take guidance on, on framing these questions or these initiatives or, or projects that we're bringing forward? We've certainly looked at the, this community's strategic plan. A wonderful job in numerous stakeholders coming together to set forth a vision for the city in the future through this strategic plan. Uh, Michael mentioned seven critical success factors that should be guiding our work as we, we uh, look to move this city forward. So that's a big component. Uh, the city, did, on the heels of the strategic plan, we did what we call our comprehensive plan. And so what I like to say on the comprehensive plan is, what, what is this city going to be when it grows up? Think of these areas uh, that are undeveloped that will eventually develop. What envisioned uses do we see in those areas? Where should we be looking for reinvestment in this, this community? Michael's referred to the uh, thoroughfare master plan. That's part of our comprehensive plan. So that's a big uh, plan that is, goes into this decision making. Um, each one of our departments have either accreditation processes that they go through, four of our departments, public works, police, fire, and parks. We take guidance from that. Uh, many departments have strategic plans. We take guidance from those strategic plans. And then last, uh, a couple la last things that we're, we're taking guidance from. Uh, our last citizen survey, the question was, what as citizens do you feel are most important priorities for this city uh, to continue to provide or maintain? Top of the list, overall quality of police services. 80% of the respondents uh, indicated that that was the highest priority. Second highest priority, overall quality of fire and emergency medical services at 74%. And then the third, and these were pretty, these were the outliers. Um, overall maintenance of streets, municipal buildings, and facilities at 57%. The rest of the, uh, the options in that question were rated at 30% or less. So that's why I say these were the highest priorities for this community. Um, when you look at these questions, these, these three questions, they mirror that. Emergency preparedness and public safety, transportation, and city facility reinvestment. So we think we've got a very strategic approach for 100, 186 million in three questions, and obviously the mayor and the council felt strongly that that is a good approach to take because they put this forth to the voters. So I, w I did want to give a little context as to how did we get to these questions. I already uh, mentioned that facility condition assessment. That's a component of this as well. And then I'll add one last one in my mind. Uh, this community supported a public safety sales tax, a half cent public safety sales tax. That funding source is not intended for these capital projects that are on the no tax increase. Those are for enhancements, I'll call them, in personnel and equipment and programs. Um, so when you think of that funding source, um, and if you marry that with the potential for these uh, capital improvements, we think we're on a good path to continue to uh, provide a high level of safety within this community, hit all of uh, those top three uh, uh, citizen survey questions about emergency preparedness, public safety, transportation, and facility uh, reinvestment. That's great to hear. And it's amazing to see the guidance that came from this initiative from officials, <clears throat> departments, personnel, residents, a whole community coming together for these questions to be presented. So we keep on mentioning the dollar amount, 186 million. How did we get to that dollar amount? So when we were provided the opportunity to begin thinking about what kinds of projects might we take to, uh, to this community for a no tax increase, staff developed that listing. And, and safe to say it came up to be well over $400 million in projects or initiatives that we could bring forward. And we worked with the mayor and the council uh, on those to prioritize those. Uh, we ended up with $186 million as priorities. Um, this would not, $186 million, as I mentioned, would be issued in tranches, not all at once. But uh, it's important to note that the $186 million would not exhaust the city's bonding capacity. We could bond for well over $300 million uh, if, if we needed to, but that's not, not, not an approach we wanted to take here. Um, so the, the $186 million would be in tranches and managed over a period of 10-plus years, as we've talked about bringing these projects on board. So this is a longer-term plan, would not exhaust the city's bonding capacity. And just as we've done with other no-tax increases, 
once the, once you issue general obligation bonds, then you're you're paying those bonds down, and so it does not limit us to future years to go back for other no tax increase opportunities during that ten year period because that debt gets paid down over time. Well, I think we're coming to a close in our time, but I'd like to thank each of you. Um, of course, City Manager Mark Dunning, uh, Chief of Police Travis Forbes, Fire Chief Michael Snyder, and Director of Public Works Michael Park. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Thanks for listening to this episode. You can find more information about the upcoming election on the city's website, cityofls.net. Also, be sure to share this podcast and spread the word. This is paid for by the City of Lee Summit, William A. Baird, Mayor, 220 Southeast Green Street, Lee Summit, Missouri, 64063.